Hello, my friends, Jerry Rosie here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. Good morning, wherever you are, or afternoon, or evening, or whatever suits your time frame. <laughs> I think we've got a good shop talk for you this morning. Uh, off camera, we've got some visitors from Louisiana, I believe. And we've got uh, the Falks family, F-A-L-K-S, I believe and Robert, Tiffany, and then their sons, Ethan and Henry, and a grandbaby by the name of Alistair. And uh, they're staying up at the rental retreat. And for once, they didn't bring any instruments. <laughs> so I don't have to fix anything. <laughs> I hope they have a good time and uh, uh, seem like very fun folks. So um i think as a matter of fact i think robert's on his way up to a business uh deal so he's kind of like stopping off here and then i think they're splitting ways and she's going back home and he's going on to business i uh, have a few things to talk about before we get into our main subject here first of all i just want to remind everybody that we're going to be at uh, mountain view arkansas june 10th 11th and 12th and if you get free and you can come down there and play some music with us we'd love to have you or if you just want to come and listen or just go out to a catfish dinner with us on uh, Thursday evening the 10th I believe is when we're planning that uh, we go to Jojo's uh, restaurant down there which is really well known for their catfish and even though I don't eat a lot of catfish myself but I'll find something I can eat <laughs> Um, the, let's see, the best way for you, talking about the rental retreat, the best way for you to jump in the front of the line, uh, if you really do have something that needs attention, is to rent an evening at the rental retreat, and I'll fix your instrument while you wait, and you can take it home with you. So that's the only way that I can really give any priority service. Of course, you do have to pay a little extra for that, of course, but uh, if it's important to you and you need to get something fixed in a hurry, that's uh, what I would encourage you to think about. And you you can uh, start your booking process on my website. Uh, that'll, there's a form there that you can fill out. I think it takes you into uh, Facebook to get you going. And I, Next topic is I would really like to encourage you all to help me get 100,000 subscribers. And the way you can do that is to share videos. Pick out the video you like the best or the one that you think would appeal to someone else the most and uh, just send it to them on Facebook or you know whatever other means you want to send it to them and uh, you might get me another subscriber and I would really appreciate that uh, like I said before it would be kind of cool if we could break YouTube you know I think a guy this old getting 100,000 subscribers just might break it <laughs> um, I just, again, I wanted to say thank you, uh, and I really mean it uh, for all the nice compliments and comments and things that's been on the last several videos, because especially the intonation one, I really had my doubts that that one was going to go over. I kind of thought that one might go over like a lead balloon, and there have been a few folks that didn't really care for it, I have to admit, but uh, overall, it was pretty good, really, and it was better than I expected for sure. <laughs> So thank you very, very much. I appreciate the support. Uh, another thing uh, about the comments is when you see comments out there and uh, it's a subject that's been covered in a shop talk, start recommending that they watch the shop talks because, uh, you know, I would like to a bigger level and the main to be putting out fewer videos over time. And I do think, uh, please think you'll enjoy it. I hope you will anyway. And let's see, one more little trinket of information before we move on a little bit further. And that is uh, that Ford tractor that you saw me put the electronic ignition in. It turned out it was just a head gasket. I do have it all back together except for the sheet metal. But I did start it up and it runs like a top. It sounds like a brand new tractor now. So I am just tickled with that. And it's just in time for me to put the sickle bar on and cut this whole thing of hay right out in the front yard. <laughs> Um, speaking of that, I want to show you a little bit uh, around the farm today, and I've got some um, uh, drone footage here that I thought uh, you might get a kick out of. It might help you get your bearings on what the farm looks like here, so we're going to turn that on right now. This footage was taken by my grandson. Uh, I was showing him how to fly the drone, and uh, this was a couple of years ago, actually, during the wintertime. 
If you guys want to come around, you can kind of stand here and kind of look at it. You, you won't really be on camera much if you want to see what, what's, what I'm showing here. Um, and uh, anyway, that's my big barn. The story on that big old uh, barn with the, I guess that's a red roof or rust roof mostly, <laughs> that used to be a church up in Mexico, Missouri, and they disassembled it and brought it down here and made it into a barn. That's my son's farm that you can see off in the background there. And uh, he's, he kind of has the rest of the valley down toward the river. Now you're looking down my valley to the south uh, and south, kind of south, southeast, I guess you'd say. All of that timber has been logged since these videos, but you honestly, I'm not lying to you, you still would be hard pressed to tell where the logging happened because they, they did selective cutting. This is, you know, he was flipping the thing around a lot, so I cut out a lot of footage so that you didn't have to see all the spinning. There's our pond right there. That pond's about 12 foot deep and has some pretty big fish in it. Those two white things you saw was our entry uh, gate. There's the rental retreat there, or, uh, the one that you can see the best. The thing in the lower right corner is a metal building where I store tractors and trucks and trailers. And then that little building there with the red roof on the, in the, on the right there is the old original farmhouse built in the late 1890s. Um, that's the road coming in. And again, that's looking down my son's uh, valley there and from toward the little Piney River is where, and that's back south again. He, you know, it, this was just a young boy learning to fly a drone. So that's what the footage is. And uh, you'll see here in just a moment. And then I've got a shot, I believe here, coming up real soon of our house, uh, which you don't have in this. And uh, we're up to 99 viewers. So we're just about to crack 100 here. That's good. I thought I cut out a little more of this, but uh, apparently I didn't. Okay, so, well, eventually we'll show a picture of the house here. This is the hill right behind the uh, shop, actually. And uh, most of the woods that you can see off in the distances is uh, Mark Twain National Forest, by the way. Uh, well, I guess I missed the... the the clip on my house. I, I guess I was talking and didn't realize that it must have panned up already. I'm sorry. There's a, uh, or maybe I didn't. Maybe <laughs> I don't know where we are, but uh, that's my wife's greenhouse there. Yeah, it is landing. So yeah, and that's my son or my grandson, Tyler. And uh, he's the one that was doing all that camera work. <laughs> so and you can see how the how he landed the drone. It landed pretty well. So I thought you might just get a kick out of kind of seeing how everything laid out here. And uh, hopefully that made some sense to you. Uh, somebody says, must be nice to have money. Well, if you know anybody that's got money, send them this way. <laughs> it, it may seem like I've got money. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and I just want to be clear on this. I bought this place on a shoestring budget. I still owe money on it, and uh, I wouldn't have been able to afford it had it not been trashed. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this. This place was trashed worse than just about any city dump you've ever seen. Uh, there, You couldn't take one step in any direction without stepping on a tin can or trash or, you know, or an old bathtub. I mean, this place was so... And I'm not kidding. And there were the high. I mean, they were seven foot, eight foot high. First cutting the weeds here, I would drive my tractor and the brush hog, and I would lean off like this because the briars were coming over and grabbing me. I mean, they were that tall, and I'm not exaggerating. The uh, and, and and this is the true story too. Didn't even, I'd already bought the place, didn't even know it, but I bought a tractor with it <laughs> because it was out there in the weeds, and I. Uh, Still hadn't moved here yet, but I was cutting all the weeds. And so when I found the tractor, I loaded it up on a trailer, pulled it all the way back to uh, my home in St. Louis County. And in 45 minutes, had it running. So, <laughs> and they, I bet you the people that sold it didn't even realize the tractor was sitting out there in the weeds. That's how bad it was. It was bad. Trust me, you have no idea. And uh, the, the rest of that story, and I'll tell you real quick, um, was that the very first day this came up for sale, 
I saw it on the internet and I called instantly and I was already fifth in line to look at it. And uh, so there was, there was one couple flew in from New York, another couple drove in from Oklahoma City, and there was three couples from St. Louis. And we were the third couple from St. Louis. So we were fifth in line to look at it. So the moment I got to talk to the guy, I, I was just like beside myself because I was so afraid somebody else was going to buy it, you know, even though it was trash. My wife was almost in tears because it looked so bad, you know, she didn't, she didn't want it. And, uh, I, you know, I knew instantly I wanted it, you know, and because uh, my dad had a landscaping business, I could see through all of the whole mess, you know, I knew it was going to be a lot of work, but I could see through it. And so I'm just eating this realtor up and he's, he's like, he's like backing up and I'm just right in his face, you know, and I'm saying, did you get a contract yet? Did you get a contract? And he's going, no, but the people from Oklahoma said they're going to buy it and they're going to put their Appaloosas and their Buffalo out there. And the, I said, no, stop, back up the truck. Did they give you any money down? Did they give you a contract? No, they didn't do that. Well, then they're not buying it. I'm buying it right now. I'm standing in the driveway. Haven't even been in a building yet. Haven't walked through a house. Haven't done nothing. I'm standing in the driveway and I said, I'm buying it right now. <laughs> and he says, oh, don't you want to see the house first? <laughs> I said, no, I don't care what the house looks like. I had no clue what the house was. And it turns out the house is a monster. I mean, it's like 144 feet long. It's got four fireplaces. It, they just abused everything so badly here that it, <laughs> that's the only reason the other people didn't jump on it instantly because they knew it was going to be so much work to clean it up. So it's not a case of having money, trust me. And as a matter of fact, I'll even tell you what I paid for it. They, they, they were asking $250,000 for it. Now I had seen the realtor on his cell phone all day and because uh, it was like two in the afternoon by the f time I finally got to talk to him. We got there at nine in the morning. <laughs> so uh, you can see why I was a little anxious. Anyway, I, I said, the only thing I want you to do, though, is I want you to call the owner and I want you to buy her here that'll give $10,000 today. I'm not going to take two ten. Today's the first. They're asking two fifty. I said, I know that. I'm not stupid. I know they won't take that, but I want to hear you make that offer. So he, he gets on the phone. He says, Bob, I got a guy here who says he'll give you two ten today. Would you take that? And I, and I can hear Bob over the phone answering. Bob says, no, but I'd take 235. And I said, sold. <laughs> Instantly. I didn't even wait for the realtor to tell me. I said, sold. I'll take it. <laughs> so that's how I bought the place. And uh, I, you know, it wasn't, technically I could have paid cash because I had had a huge 401k and I was cashing it in. But I didn't. I just invested the 401k and uh, took a regular conventional loan on it. And so I still owe money on it. <laughs> and the four, by the way, the 401k is gone. So, you know, there, there's no money here. Trust me. There is none. It's zero. In fact, prior to uh, the uh, business taking off here on YouTube, it was kind of uh, touch and go. <laughs> Ron was afraid I was going to have to sell the place. That's the, that's the true story of it. So there's no money here. I just want you to understand that. But we're not hurting either. I'm not crying poor mouth. We're doing all right. Um, let's see. So let's move on to the what we're really here to talk about today. And that is dendrochronology and, um, you know, quarter sawn wood and how it affects instruments and who cares, right? You know, well, you probably should care because quarter sawn uh, is a good thing when it comes to musical instruments. Now, we spare no, uh, you know, expense when it comes to developing props here at uh, Rosa Stringworks. So I had my prop department work up these props for you. <laughs> My prop department, you kind of know, is Caleb, but uh, anyway. All right, so this is a tree. Well, it could be. And, you know, you know, everybody knows, obviously, that trees grow in rings like that. And dendrochronology is basically the study of tree rings, and it's kind of the pattern in the tree rings, even, is part of the study, and 
you know, that, that means like how wide the tree ring is. And then maybe the next year it's, it's really wide. And then the next year it's really s narrow. And maybe for the next three years, it's really narrow. And then it gets wide again. Well, they study that kind of thing and they can date very accurately. Uh, and there's, you know, all the trees kind of grow the area of that. If it's a really poor year, well, then all the tree rings are going to be, and if, and if it's a really good year, all the tree rings are going to be bigger. Um, you, you know, for instruments, how that affects instruments is that typically you want the old growth forests. They grew slow, the rings are close together, the wood is very strong, etc. When you talk about quarter sawing lumber for instruments, the sawmills are very familiar with quarter sawing. They don't like to do it because it's a lot harder than traditional slab sawing. Now, what is slab sawing first, or what I call slab sawing, plain sawing? There's a million words for it, and everybody will have a different word for it. But, but slab sawing is you just, it's just like what it sounds like. You just start, and you just start cutting, and you just keep cutting boards out of that tree, and you, then you knock off the edges, you know, or you leave the live edge on if you prefer. And live edge is big these days, and as you can see on a lot of videos. But that's all plain sawed lumber is. It just cuts across the wood like this. And all the growth rings are, are cupped in the board. And that causes the lumber to cup as it dries. And uh, it will cup one way or the other. And, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing on an instrument. When you ask a sawmill, just a standard sawmill, to give you quarter sawed lumber, which, if they'll even do it, and not all of them will, here's how they do it. And we'll turn the prop this way. They'll saw this, they'll first of all, they'll just saw the whole thing in half and they'll saw it into quarters. And then they take a slice right here. And as you can see, the growth rings are going perpendicular in the wood, see? In that board there, they're going perpendicular through. So in other words, that's why when you look down at a guitar top, you see those real fine long lines. It's because that would be the top of the guitar right there. And that's what you're seeing is you're looking down on those lines. Hope that makes sense. To After they cut that board out at a saw, they'll turn the same quarter and they'll, and they'll cut this board out. And then they'll turn it and they'll cut this board out. And as you can see, as you get further and further cutting those out, it's still quarter sawed to some degree, but it's more of a slant saw at that point. Out here, it's, it, it's not going through the, uh, the board perpendicular anymore. It's going through at an angle. It's still suitable, you know, for making an instrument. If you really, you know, we're pressed for wood, I would rather have that than I would a, a flat sawn board for making an instrument. But the more quarter sawn you can get, the better. And generally speaking, the more decorative it's going to look because you get those medullary, medullary uh, rays that run through the board at, at perpendicular angles. And some of that's that curly uh, maple look, and some of it's just, uh, I call it like little flecks or little winking things that just happen in the wood. And you turn the wood a different direction, and you see these little things pop up, and they kind of shine and glow to your eye. And the quarter saw the better. So this is the way a traditional sawmill would cut wood. This is not necessarily the best way to quarter saw your wood. Let me show you a better way for musical instruments. Again, we spare no expense here. I mean, these are, these are some high dollar props. So this is the way the fellow that I buy wood from up in Fulton, Missouri, this is the way he cuts his wood. He cuts it just like you were slicing a pie. Now notice how every board comes out where it's totally perpendicular. Now, if you look at the dark lines, like <laughs> everything's backwards in the camera, sorry. But if you look at the dark lines here, um, that would be like one wedge. And then, and then the thin line in between is how he splits it. And then what you do is you open that up on that thin line and it's book matched. In other words, the grain on this side matches the grain on that side perfectly. You can't do any better than that and makes it perfectly book matched. This dark center that I have here, as you know, as you're cutting it in pie slices, obviously the wood gets so thin down here. And by the way, that very heart wood or center of the wood is not any good anyway. And you don't really want to use that in an instrument. So that part there is just discarded, you know. So that little black is your waste for the most part. And the rest of it's pretty much used. And that's how they cut the wood for the instruments. Now, 
you know, we're not talking a tree the size of this piece of paper. We're talking trees that are gigantic and, uh, you know, like the old growth uh, Sitka spruce and that sort of thing. So, you know, it may look like there's a lot of waste here too, or like there would be a lot of waste on a guitar top. And what they would do then, you get them to imagine that this wedge would be much thicker and they would perhaps take a slice off of that wedge, uh, off the sides of that wedge for a guitar top. And then the rest of it, they could use for a mandolin or a violin or supposing that's how they do it. I honestly don't know. I haven't actually watched them do the whole process, but that would work, you know life what this actually looks like so this is boards that i bought from the fellow up in fulton missouri it's old standard uh, wood by the way is the name of his company uh john griffith he's a really good guy and uh so that's you can see that that is exactly what they're doing and it, hopefully you can see the lines through there and how they match up and you can see that the lines are totally perpendicular and then you open this up whoops <laughs> that was heavy and then you open it up and it's exactly book matched the grain matches exactly from one side to the other that's what they mean when they say book matched okay so why is it that you need to use quarter sawn wood and, and book matched wood first of all it's more stable I mean, it doesn't cup and bow and twist like standard slab sawn wood will. Um, not as much anyway. It's far more stable, in fact. And that's why I pretty much insist on every board in the instrument being quarter sawn. I just kind of, that's just my thing. Not everybody agrees with that. I, you know, let's just be clear about that. I mean, there are a lot of folks that would, that prefer plain sawn wood for the backs. Uh, they feel it gives it a more woody sound, um, and that's okay. I'm, you know, I'm good with that. If that's what you prefer and you want to do that, that's okay. Uh, once the wood is dried, it becomes a lot more stable. Now, that's the other thing about it is that when they dry the wood, in fact, the fellow up in Fulton, he does everything. He he, he literally, physically goes gets the log. Like he'll drive up to Canada or to the Adirondack Mountains and bring back the Adirondack spruce. He maintains it there on his, on his place. He, he keeps it wet uh, until he's ready to saw it. And then he, uh, so that it doesn't split and crack and break. Because as the wood dries out from the end of the log, it will split, crack, and break. Uh, and then he saws it on his, on his uh, bandsaw mill and he cuts those wedges like that. And then he actually dries it himself. The reason I know so much about this, I've been dealing with the same guy for dang near 40 years. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, so I go up there and see him all the time. So I see what he's doing. I haven't sit there the whole time he's been sawing, you know, but I have seen a lot of what, he's, what he does in his operation. And um, then he dries it down to 6% dryness. Now, you can't hardly get it that dry. I mean, it's pretty doggone hard to get it that dry. It, people think that it will dry out like that, and people are always worried that their instrument is too dry. I'm worried the exact opposite. I'm always worried the instrument's too wet. I mean, when you put an instrument in your house, if you have a human house, it's gonna suck up way more moisture than it's gonna lose. I just flat believe but that's just the way it is. When you take this wood from him, it's only 6%, you know, it's been dried down to 6%. When I set it in my shop here, it actually gains moisture. It doesn't lose any more moisture sitting on my shelf. I like to let it set on my shelf for a year so it's kind of stabilized, you know, um, or the longer the better, you know. And so people are, in my opinion, completely worried about the wrong thing. I truly, truly, truly believe that that whole humidity thing started in the 60s. People found a gimmick that they could sell in a music store and they started pushing it and one, you know, lie led to the next and everybody felt like they had to humidify their instruments after that. And that's where it came from. Prior to that, nobody humidified their instruments, you know, and there's still plenty of those old instruments that are just fine. And then there's going to be people that's going to argue with me and say, but look at those old instruments are all cracked. Well, most of those are Gibsons. <laughs> and I've told you before, those were built under stress. Every time those instruments crack, it's those sides are springing out, man. And I mean, you, once you cut the back off of a Gibson, good luck getting that back 
you know, getting those sides to shrink in to fit the back. It just doesn't hardly happen. I'm sorry to pick on Gibson, but it's the truth. I, I've been doing this for 40 years, and those are the ones that have the problem, <laughs> and especially those old ones. And uh, anyway, you know, you can believe what you want. If you want to believe it's, you know, uh, you know, the fact that it's dried out, I don't believe that. And, and then people will say, well, you can smell it's dry. Well, what you're really smelling is over years, the, don't get me wrong, the wood is dry. I'm not saying it isn't. But over the years, like the Stradivari violins, they've, it's had time for those resins inside the wood to dry even more. And then they vibrate out and they make this distinctive smell and this distinctive uh, powdery stuff inside the instrument and you can smell that and they all kind of smell the same all those old instruments all have that unique smell and it's because those resins have worked their way out of the wood that's why the older the violin the sweeter the music it's just that simple it's not rocket science um i mean it kind of is but it isn't i hope that makes sense to you um, okay, so I was also going to go into the different kinds of trees and, and things like that. And by the way, get your questions ready for any of this. I would appreciate questions at the end. And uh, again, let me just remind you to put a question mark at the beginning of your question so that I can find it easier because it's really hard to, to find the questions as, you know, as they're scrolling up the screen and I'm not a fast reader either. Okay, uh, so let's talk about some different kinds of wood uh, that I recommend and don't recommend. Um, most of your exotic woods, most of those hardwoods are good instrument woods. I mean, almost all of them are. They're very dense, they're very hard. Um, you need to learn how to pick up the board and tap on it and, and tell if it's gonna make a note. There is an art to tapping on a board, believe it or not. You, you, my method is to hold it with two fingers, but so that it has the least amount of contact. And then you tap on it. it you, know, you hold it, you know, approximately, you kind of look at the length of your board and you kind of hold it up toward the top of your board always. And you let it hang as loose as you can let it hang. And put your ear up close to it. And probably not ringing like it is. I think these guys can hear this ring here in the shop. It rings a little bit like a wind chime or something. It's a little higher pitched in this case, but it depends on where you tap on it. You get a little different tone, a little different note. But my point is that you need to learn how to do that. And if you're bored, when you pick it up and you tap on it and you can hear a sustained ring, most likely it'll be a good instrument board. So that's the first test. Uh, the next thing is that, you know, uh, most like I said, most exotics are good. You should know the difference between backwood and topwood, or sidewood and topwood. It's totally different. So the, the tops are almost always, and I say almost because there are a couple caveats, almost always made out of softwood. Softwoods are basically evergreens. I mean, that's just to put it quick and simple. That's the way you can kind of know a softwood from a hardwood. Softwoods are evergreens for the most part. And... Um, uh, like the, the three main softwoods that are used are spruce, western cedar, and redwood. And all of those make excellent sounding instruments. I mean, I've used all three of those <clears throat> and they all work great. Do I have a preference or can I tell, can I tell the difference honestly between Engelmann spruce and, uh, you know, Sitka spruce and uh, Adirondack spruce, no, to be perfectly truthful, I can't. I really can't. I, it's just about the same. Um, I'm sure if you had it all stacked up there and you could compare one and one, you could probably tell a minor amount of difference. But honestly, I really can't tell the difference. Uh, I can definitely tell the difference between spruce, western cedar, and western cedar and redwood, etc. Now, if you really are getting into building an instrument and it's your first instrument, I highly recommend that you do use something like redwood because it's so easy to carve. It's, it's just easy to carve. I mean, it just carves like butter. So you might want to try redwood for your top. And it's fairly easy to come by in quarter sawn uh, boards. You can generally find a redwood quarter sawn board at a hardware store. And that's my next story. I want to tell you this. I, I'm going to digress here, but I think you'll get a kick out of this story. Um, I used to work for Bell, AT&T. And uh, 
I, on my lunch hour, I, I was an out, what they called an outside rep, and I would go out and talk to customers face to face. It took me a long time to get that job, but once I got it, I loved it. It was great. They gave me a company car and I would go talk to customers face to face. Well, you know, I'd be out in different locations of the city and my thing to do at my lunch hour, this probably sounds totally boring to everybody else, but it was cool to me, was to walk through hardware stores. And I, I just enjoyed it. And, uh, I, and I often would be looking for lumber and wood and things like that, because a lot of them carry a little pieces of wood and stuff and areas, you know. Well, I went into, I'll never forget, it was called Essen Hardware and it was in Manchester, Missouri. And I was on my lunch hour and I'm walking through and I see this stack of two by fours. And you know, that wasn't impressive. I didn't care about two by fours. But then I look and see what they're stacked on. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding you, here's this stack of two by fours, four foot high <laughs> and maybe four foot wide, you know. Eight foot, I believe they were eight footers. And I look at and the board they're stacked on, I can see the end of it, and it looks like a quarter sawn, perfectly quarter sawn piece of um, redwood. And I went, wow, that looks like an awesome piece of wood. <laughs> I can't believe they stacked all these dang two by fours on that, you know? So I, I get down and I'm down on the ground looking at, out there trying to make sure it's, it looks like a really viable piece of wood, you know, and the best I can tell, it's perfect, you know. I mean, like, it's like perfect. It'd make the best top you'd ever want to make, you know. And so uh, I go start, I start looking, you know. I find somebody and the guy says, well, you'll have to talk to the manager because that's a stack board. We don't use that. So I grab the manager and I bring him over there. And I said, how much would you charge me for that board right there? He goes, that board? He says, we're not selling that board. I said, but I'll buy it. I'll pay you whatever you want for it. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, I'm not kidding you. I'll pay you whatever you want for it. <laughs> I said, just as long as you can maybe get somebody to help me unstack this and, and you know, and we'll get it out of there. And so we did. Me and this other kid, we started unstacking this whole big pile of tubing for us. We grabbed this board out of there and it turned out it was perfect. It was just perfect. You couldn't ask for a better board. So I, and it made the note, man, I mean, it just chimed like a bell. So I walk up to the cash register and the manager's standing there. <laughs> I said, okay, after all that hassle, how much are you gonna charge me for it? He goes, would a dollar fifty be too much? <laughs> I said, no, that's not too much at all. And I paid him $1.50 for that top. And I am not exaggerating. I promise you to this day, that's one of my loudest mandolins I ever built. In fact, here's another short story on that particular mandolin. I drove down to Grassy, Missouri to a um, bluegrass festival down in Grassy, Missouri. And some friends of mine were jamming right at the gate where you drive into the park. And so I just pulled over. I paid my money, pulled over and got out and started jamming with them. Well, it was at least a football field length all the way up to where the cook shack was. Now, every, you have to know that almost everybody there knew me. You know, I, I'd been around and they'd see me on stage and stuff. And so anyway, that's, that's the other thing. So I just want to mention that because that's important. Because when I get up to the cookhouse later for lunchtime, and I, I asked for a hamburger or whatever I typically get, you know. And the lady in there, she goes, I know exactly what time you got here this morning. And I said, what do you mean? She goes... I could hear that mandolin. You were all the way down there at the gate and I could hear that mandolin over everything else around here. <laughs> she goes, I knew it was you. I said, oh, doggone. So that'll give you some idea, $1.50 top. <laughs> and it made the probably the loudest instrument I've ever built. It was an awesome, and that was Redwood, by the way. So Redwood is awesome. It really is. You, you should, uh, don't rule it out at all. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would say about it is maybe carve it just a little bit thicker than you would carve your spruce because it's a little bit softer and it's it's definitely easier to carve there's no question about it um okay i think i've digressed enough there oh i i did want to tell you some other woods that could be used for instruments that are overlooked uh and and probably the main one for me at least in our area now this isn't going to be everywhere in the world but in in missouri and in much of the u.s it's sycamore. Sycamore is a great tone wood. It, it's, it's an incredible tone wood. Uh, it's completely overlooked, be, and here's why. Because if you took a sycamore log to a sawmill, well, they'll saw it. They won't give you any trouble sawing it. But if you took it to somebody to dry it, 
they're going to look at you like you got two heads because it dries the worst of any wood in the whole free world. It cups and it twists and it bows and it just, it just doesn't dry worth a darn. But if you can quarter saw it and maybe cut it into lengths that you know you're going to build, need for your instrument and you know, uh, quarter it up just like this is quartered up here, even if you just have to split it with a, with a splitting hammer, you, know, you don't have to necessarily saw it perfectly like this. And, and you get your wedges, put them in your attic maybe, space them out, let it dry out for you know, a, a few weeks uh, in the attic or whatever, and keep checking it with a moisture meter every so often. And once you get it down to about 6 to 8%, you'll be good. Um, it's going to twist, it's going to cup. Even a little tiny board like this is going to twist a lot. So that's why you want to cut it oversized. And then basically all you do is you plane the twist and the cup out of it and uh, awesome tone wood. Uh, the mandolin I'm playing presently is made out of six. The reason I even had the idea, uh, when <laughs> this goes all back to when I was a kid. You know, a lot of firewood even when I was a kid. And now I cut, but even then I cut a lot. And you know, kids do dumb things. And as you're going to the trailer to throw the, board, the, the logs in, I would click them together like I was beating a drum and the sycamore would just shoot the sound down the valley. All their other woods would just go thunk, you know, nothing. You'd get nothing. But with the sycamore, when you tap it together, it, you could just hear it click, and it would just send the signal down, down the valley. And you could hear it echo off the hills and everything. So I knew from when I was a kid that this wood was different than other wood, you know. And so when I, you know, started building instruments, it was, you know, and I had a kind of a coincidental thing, I had a conservation agent out here at the farm and he said to me, he says, you need to cut down those sycamore trees. He said, they, they, they don't belong out here in your fields. Uh, the birds have planted those. He said, those, need, those should be growing down by the river and places like that. He says, if I was you, I'd cut down a lot of those. Okay, fine. So I cut down one or two and um, I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and save them and make an instrument out of it. And I've made about a half dozen instruments out of them and every one of them is awesome. Now. I got to be honest and tell you that I wasn't the first one to do that. I actually heard another fellow build violins out of sycamore and they were awesome also. So sycamore is a really good wood. I wouldn't overlook it. It's a pain in the neck to dry. But once you get it dry, it's just as stable as any other board. You won't have any trouble with it warping or, or moving once you get it dry. I think I've burned your ears off. Are you okay? Are you still alive? <laughs> we have 159 viewers, whether we uh, want, uh, way we just dropped 159, we just went to 151. Man, I must have just really turned them off there at the last. Okay, let's start looking for some questions here. Um, do we have any questions this morning? What time is it, by the way? 8.40, so we got about 20 minutes left. Uh, by the way, before we even started all this, uh, I, yesterday I said to Caleb, I said, I don't know if I've got enough material to talk about here. I said, I don't know if I can stretch this out or not. And Caleb goes, you won't have any problem. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of those left-handed compliments that, you know, on one hand, I know what I'm talking about and I'll be able to talk about it. On the other hand, I can, you know, if you ask me what time it is, I can tell you how to build a watch, you know. And so he, he's cutting me off at the knees. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of one of the double-edged compliments there, I think. All right, so let's get serious and see if we can find a, a uh, question or two. I don't see any question marks at the beginning of any paragraphs here, so I'm just going to start reading, and I'm going to be slow reading. <laughs> Give me a second. Sycamore might be a good wood, but I detest the tree. Leaves everywhere, the winter. Yeah. Well, that may be true, but there's there's your way you get rid of it. <laughs> Just cut it down, make an instrument out of it. Um, you know, sycamore, by the way, makes really good siding for buildings. They used to use it a lot uh, for that purpose because once you get it dry, it's stable as heck and it just doesn't rot or anything. I mean, it's a really good wood. But it, don't try to dry it yourself or you'll be very frustrated. I mean, you know, don't plan to dry a lot of it, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, uh, it's, it's safe to say sickle would make a good top back. No, it's only back and side wood because it's a hardwood. 
You should really only use softwoods for your top. You should use, okay, I told you there was one ex, or some exceptions. Um, that exception would be mahogany. Uh, people do use mahogany for the tops, the backs, and the sides. Mahogany is about the softest hardwood there is, and that's how they get away with it, I think. But in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, I haven't heard a mahogany topped instrument that can compete with the others. That's just my opinion. So, you know, do yourself a favor. If you're gonna to go to all the trouble to build an instrument, use hardwoods on the back and sides, use softwoods on the top, and don't vary from that, and you'll be fine. Uh, there's always people wanting to, or thinking that they're stretching the envelope by trying something new. Trust me, it's already been tried. And if it worked, they'd be doing it in the factories. I mean, you know, you, you can, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to be innovative. That's not what I'm saying. But on the other hand, almost anything you think you're the first one to try, good luck with that one because almost every single thing you can think of on these instruments has been tried. Trust me. I have seen just about everything you can possibly imagine. And then some. How are your hands? Well, I would like to tell you they're good, but they're not. Um, actually, they're kind of bad. As a matter of fact, just before I started this, I somehow bumped this one. Oh my gosh, I thought I was going to cry. <laughs> and I didn't even hit it hard. It just, it, it just, it's all in how you move them and how you hit them, you know. Um, I'll get by. That's all I can tell you. Am I ready for the weekend? Uh, yeah, but I don't ever have any weekends anymore. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Caleb, yeah, laugh out loud. Yeah, he, Caleb, you know, I, I, I told you before, he doesn't say anything. I mean, like, he'll be there, he'll be there all day long and won't say nothing. But when he says something, he usually gets his point across. <laughs> so, it's those quiet ones that always get you, you know. Uh, what about mahogany? Uh, tops, yeah, that's what I think I just mentioned. Ho mahogany, or you, you, you say ha ha benny. I don't know what you're actually spelling there, but I think you're talking mahogany. And mahogany works. I, you know, I'm not impressed with it personally. I think it's great for backs and and, and sides, but it's not a, a good top wood in my opinion. Um, for your neck, can be a lot of different things. I would say you don't. Um, a hard, I mean, a soft wood for your roost. I would not use redwood. I would not use western cedar for your neck. It is a good choice for a neck because it's a little bit harder than those other woods and it's stable and, you know, it's a pretty good wood for a neck and it's a little lighter. And that's the reason why mahogany is often used on a neck when the rest of the guitar is made out of something else. Um, the one thing about making a slightly heavier neck is that you typically get a little more sustain with a heavier neck. So you could make your neck out of the same wood as you make your back and sides. In other words, you could make a rosewood neck, you could make a paduke neck, and I have done that. And they make great sounding instruments and they have great sustain, all that. But you know, it, generally speaking, I think I like to you know use something like paduke or rosewood for the back and sides. I like mahogany for the neck, and I have to have some kind of a soft wood on the top. And I prefer all of it be quarter sawn. That's my preference. Even though of 60 to turn it to 50 or to, so I went to 55 actually, and even that helped with my, um, oh, what was it? The, I don't know what you call it. The, the, where the where you sharpen the blade and you get that rough edge yeah. and it curls up. I can't, I can't think of what I'm, a burr. A burr. That's the word. A burr. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just can't come up with the word sometimes. Uh, but yeah, a burr. I was getting a burr, and that's why I reversed the saw. So uh, once I changed that angle to 55 degrees, and especially once I went to these new uh, uh, grinding discs, grinding wheels with, the, with, I guess they're diamond impregnated or something like that. Uh, I forget what they're called. CDB wheels, something like that. Anyway, once I went to those new wheels, uh, whew, that just cleaned everything up. And, and uh, I also, in my video about that grinder, I also figured out 
what was wrong with that grinder. I kept telling you I had to do all these weird things to get it to cut the same from one side to the other. And seriously, they manufactured it incorrectly. They somehow got the degrees off. And once I figured that out and, and move it to 30 degrees on one side and 25 on the other, no more, no more trouble. Don't have to do anything special. I just have to remember to, on the one side, I turn it to 30. On the other side, I turn it to 25. It cuts perfectly now. And it makes those chains so quick and sharp. And for a guy like me that's cutting that much firewood, that's important. I can sharpen a chain now. I, even, on, even on my 25 inch saw, I can sharpen that chain in like two minutes. I mean, seriously, and it's just like brand new. And, and it, a lot of that's due to that new uh, grinding wheel. So you, you ought to check those out and check out that video if you haven't seen it. Okay, uh, years and years ago, I found a tree with a 21 inch diameter or 22 inch diameter while harvesting firewood, seven feet in length, tight, clear, straight grain. Uh, yeah, but you didn't say what kind of tree. Okay, but uh, yeah, yeah, you can. You'd be surprised what you can find, even even around here. You know, you've seen me use that yellow wood, that Osage orange. That's beautiful wood. I mean, you'd be surprised what you can find. And my little sawmill now lets me experiment a little bit with that, where I can, you know, cut down a tree. If I, it, you know, trust me, I've cut down at least most kinds of trees there are here on this farm. I've pretty much cut down all of the different kinds. And I see different interesting things. And now I can take my sawmill if I want to and saw those up. Like cherry, for instance, gives me a nice clean, you know, symmetrical color, uh, brown type wood. And then um, the uh, yellow is real, always very symmetrical color. So you, you can count on it's what I'm saying. And uh, there's some other woods too that have some nice colors. Um, Looking for questions. Have you ever used oak for a fretboard? No, I haven't. You know, I am not a fan of oak at all for instruments. Not at all. I mean, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't even use it hardly for a stand, let alone on the instrument. Uh, oaks, oaks are great firewood. <laughs> it, it's also good for furniture and, and stuff like that. It's pretty wood, you know, but it's not good for sound. It's, it's just not. You pick up oak and I don't care how you hold it, you tap it, it just goes thud. You know, it just doesn't do anything. And it's heavy as a brick. So, you're, you know, I had a fellow, he was so proud of this electric guitar that he had just built and he built it out of a tree he cut down himself, you know, and he was so proud of it. And, and he did a pretty good job, but it was out of oak. And I'm telling you, it was an electric solid body guitar. That sucker was so stinking heavy. It would have killed me to play it. I mean, it, it was just crazy. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> Oak's just not a good choice for instruments. Just stay away from oak. Uh, there's probably others like that that I'm not aware of, but oak's so common that people use it all the time for stuff, and uh, I just wouldn't do it in an instrument. Uh, it was a lodgepole pine. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, I, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert in all the different kinds of pine uh, at all, but I, I definitely know about yellow pine. <laughs> and I, I would stay away from that for your, for your instrument. But the other pines very much might work, uh, especially if, you know, if you can, like, let's just say, uh, I don't know, take your fingernail and make an impression in it. If it's soft enough to do that, you probably could make an instrument out of it. Why don't we viewers petition Starlink to install it, the farm especially? Yeah, that'd be great. I'm still waiting on Starlink. <laughs> it would be awesome. Um, I don't know, you know, it's, I've seen videos where it's being installed everywhere and nobody's contacted me yet. And I, you know, and I, like I told you, I cannot find a way to contact those people. I have looked everywhere. Thank you all for all the nice comments I'm seeing scrolling up the screen. I'm trying to, it just doesn't sound right. <laughs> Um, let's see, I'm looking for other questions here. 119 viewers. Well, I don't think we got as many viewers today as we did last week. I guess I must have turned everybody off last week. <laughs> I would appreciate it, though, if you would share these videos and try to get us, uh, get us some more viewers. I would really appreciate that. 
Um, I think we're out of questions here. Oh, here's one. Have I come across instruments attacked by woodworm? Yeah, I, I definitely have. Yeah, definitely. No question about that at all. You'll, you, especially old violins, uh, you'll find uh, holes through them like crazy, little tiny holes. Um, and you, you first kind of wonder what they are, but it's definitely some kind of a, I don't know if it's a worm or if it's a, you know, some kind of an insect or what, but there's, you know, they call them woodworms, but uh, you know, it's definitely holes and it's definitely made by a critter. That's for sure. By the way, uh, that's another thing that, that I see a lot is uh, old violins keeping their old bows in the cases. Something will chew the hair off of those bows and, uh, or at least it appears to, to be something that's chewing the hairs off those bows. And um, you, you'll open up the case one day and all the hair will be loose off of the end of the bow or whatever. And so, and by the way, while we're on that, whenever you store your violin, always keep the hair loose. In other words, unscrew the hair a couple of turns so that the hair is not got any tension on it. You don't want tension on your bow while it's being stored. Um, let's see, would Paduk make a good sides and back for a mandolin? Probably. I have never done it, uh, but I would think it would be a real good wood for a mandolin. You know, I try to stay a little more traditional with the mandolins because, you know, honestly, that's what sells. And if you don't stay pretty close to what sells, you're just kind of wasting your time if you're trying to make a living at it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I would think Paduk would be a good choice for a mandolin. I really would. I, I just have never tried it. A camera with less definition, it would help a lot with the upload. Uh, yeah, actually this Logitech camera that Caleb bought is what we're using now. And uh, we, we've turned it down. Are, are we having trouble today? Is it not working? I, I, you know, I can't tell from this end, unfortunately. But I haven't really noticed a lot of negative comments on it. So I'm hoping it's okay. But... Um, We've tried to turn the resolution down and everything too, and tried to, you know, I've turned off other computers and other routers and etc. So anyway, we, we're doing the best we can with what we have to work with, which is just a T-Mobile, uh, you know, cell tower internet service. That's all I've got right now. How do uh, testing moisture work? How does that work? Um, well, they make a little moisture meter and I've got one over here. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Opal's got a little shop of coffee, tea, and soda pop written on the made of window sign. Ruby and Pearl are her best friends. There you'll find the three of them Monday, Wednesday, Friday, half past nine. Well, that was Renee again. Uh, I love her voice. This is a moisture meter that I happen to have. And honestly, it's pretty old school. I've had it for 20 years or longer. And uh, this one is one that's a, a contact one. You just lay it on the surface and these contacts will tell you what the percentage of moisture is. And... Um, you know, they have there's two basic kinds and you know one of them is a surface contact like this the other kind has pins in it and you stick the pins down in the wood and it reads the moisture content i don't know that much about them to be perfectly honest with you i just know uh that they're necessary if you're planning to dry a lot of wood i don't really dry much wood uh, to be honest uh i mean i'll use pieces here and there but that wood's been sitting for a long time and i just let it acclimate to this to the shop for the most part and most of those pieces are so thin sitting on the shelf that they'll dry pretty pretty quickly really so i don't really worry about that too much but if i was really going to make an instrument uh, out of wood that i cut here on the farm i would definitely check it out and dry it like i did with the sycamore but i haven't done that in quite a while Uh, let's see. Uh, he says, uh, he's letting me know that there is some buffering, but it's, it's not you. I'm doing okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, you know, it, 
I, it is what it is on the buffering. I wish it wasn't there, but 164 viewers at the moment. Camera is jumping a little. He, uh, fella says he soaks his uh, clock wood that has worm uh, damage in, in paint thinner to kill those insects. It's probably not, uh, I would say, uh, Either that or I would even use lacquer thinner. Lacquer